one, and we're rolling. Hello and welcome to the Walk Off. My name is Scott Belford. My co-host joins me, the best in the biz, Adam Mack. But this is what's going on: is that uh, you're out in rural Saskatchewan, right, just outside of Saskatoon, bud, and your internet's yeah. not great. Yeah, you got it. I did a speed test, and I'm at about two point seven megabits per second. So, but so one percent sure that- of what I usually have. Yeah. So to make sure we were able to do the cast today, Adam is going with zero video. So we've got this sweet picture of him and his, uh, what's the best way of putting it? (laughs) So so this is uh, from my wedding. Uh, My wife was getting all the, I mean, we got pictures together, right? Because that's what you do at a wedding. But then the photographers take like a bunch of like good shots of the bride. And I was like, well, I want in on that. So this is uh, my nice wedding photo with uh that's my dad my two brothers and my nephew's hands on my tummy so (laughs) it's a great pick i do love that picture so we are still in business here and we do have a big show so we're going to get into it uh first of all just wanted to thank everyone in the community who constantly follows along is interactive (laughs) follows us on twitter we actually just hit a thousand followers on twitter couple days ago so a big thank you to the blue jays twitter community who has followed us and supported us we really appreciate it you can follow us on twitter at walk off podcast on instagram the walk off podcast we thank all of our patreon adam will run down the list real quick here go ahead bud yes patreon so we've got dunedin bob we've got david Abraham, michael sarah john simon rashid Joshua, Jeremy, and Ian. Thank you so much to all of you for all your support. Patreon.com slash The Walk Off Podcast. We've got movie reviews. We've got behind the scenes, early access to interviews, you name it. Uh, We're going to have some more goodies going up on the Patreon in the coming weeks as well. So there you go. Perfect. All right. Uh, Obviously, we both had a show last night in Saskatoon together, which was a lot of fun. We just wound up in the same place at the same time. Yeah. Uh, last weekend, I was in Toronto for the Yankees Blue Jays series and ran into a little fan of the walk off, Curtis. And I know that we kind of. Man- <laughs> it's up now. There you go. Very for cool. everyone in the walk off community who has heard us talk about Curtis, you could see and check out what a cool glove the kid has. Nine years old, Curtis is, and he's Very got cool. that. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I know. The eye black really oh, sold running. it for me. I always loved having eye black on when I played ball, so it's cool seeing the uh, youth of the next generation with the eye black just taking baseball as seriously as you can. I love it. Exactly. So a big shout out to Curtis. We appreciate uh, you following along and watching the episodes and everything, bud. And uh, we'll definitely try and. Watch the f bombs more going forward, bud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You bet. Okay. Big show here today, Adam. I know, despite having the best record in baseball, Yankees fans have found a way to still be big whiny babies. So we'll talk All Star fan voting, a type, uh, a really tough White Sox series. Just finished up on Wednesday. Of course, yesterday was the off day. We'll talk umpiring and the Guillermo Martinez incident. Matt Chapman has been a hungry, hungry hippo at the hot corner, inhaling everything that comes his way. So we'll talk his defense and his offense, which continue to shine. Friend of the show, Matt Gage, has been as good as this team and the fan base could have hoped he could be as a 29 year old who's never played in the bigs getting called up this year. So we'll look into the big lefties numbers and what he's done recently. The Jays start a three game set against the NL central leading Milwaukee Brewers tonight. We'll preview that. Of course, we're aware that one of the big changes to the CBA was the MLB playoffs being expanded and hopes of upping competition, but it, doesn't seem to be working. So we'll talk MLB and its total lack of parity. And we'll end the show talking about the man, the legend that is Shohei Otani. Had himself a week. 
So we'll uh, show his numbers. We'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll also talk about the fact that there is a portion of the Angels fan base that no matter what this man does, refuses to show him respect or even give him his kudos. And I'm not sure what it's about, but it is interesting. So we will talk a little bit about that. So let's get into the baby Wawas, which is my favorite thing to call the New York Yankee fan base. Man, (laughs) this... Honestly, Adam, this New York Yankees team continues their torrid pace. Like, they literally are on pace for a 120-win season. They could set a record for the most wins in a season here. So, let us uh, let me ask you this. 2001, do you know who won the World Series? Ooh. Was it the Yankees? Yankees were in the World Series. They lost to the Arizona Diamondbacks. Right. Reason I ask you specifically 2001. The big unit. <laughs> yeah, the big unit. Yeah, Randy Johnson. Uh, reason I'm asking 2001, Seattle Mariners, 116 wins that season. Tied mm. the MLB record for season wins, uh, I believe, with the Chicago Cubs. Didn't win the World Series. No, they didn't. I think they won 16 of their last 18 games through September. So it's not like they just got cold at the end of the year. They were hot Mm -hmm. from start to finish. Still didn't get it done in the playoffs. So I just want to put that out there as a reminder to everybody who feels like the Yankees are this unstoppable, grinding machine of wins here that uh, anything can happen once the playoffs get here. So. Very true, and it's a great point. And, I mean, the truth is they are the best team in baseball currently, and they have been dominant. But it's funny because this fan base, this Yankees fan base, finds a way to be giant delusional babies, and they found (laughs) another way to do so. Uh, Obviously, the way the universe works is for every awful, whiny, evil fan base, there is a shining beacon of good. And in this case, it's Jays fans, right, Adam? That's yeah, the way it works. Yeah, of course. Right? No, no Jays fans are complaining right now. Nothing yeah, about so we're, out of the teal. We're the good guys uh, versus the giant evil babies that is the New York Yankees fan base. So, up to the date, All Star fan voting, the tallies were released. What was it? I think it was Monday. I know we talked about it a little bit on the mailbag, but I, yeah. I did kind of want to get into this. And let me tell you, the good guys, the Jays fans, we were out voting in full force, baby, as plenty of the Jays are in contention for fan votes uh, to start the All-Star game. So Kirk is leading his category for catcher, Vladdy, Springer, uh, Bo and Espinal are in second place in their respective positions. I mean, this Blue Jays fan base came out and voted in full force. Even Danny Jansen is fourth for DH. I know. And has, He's has played like 11 DH'd. games this year. And has not DH'd once <laughs> in those 11 games, which is just absolutely hilarious. So this, of course, to the Yankees is just the worst thing to ever happen. I don't know. I know you're not on Twitter, Adam, but no. uh, Yankees Twitter is a tizzy. <laughs> and my favorite is even after Yankees fans have their diapers changed, (laughs) they're still giant babies about this. And the Kirk, the Kirk argument is what gets under my skin the most. They're saying Kirk is being overvoted right now. They think that it should be Jose Trevino, who is honestly having, and I'm going to take my bias off for one second here. Jose Trevino is having himself a heck of a season. But if you look at the numbers, Kirk is superior in almost every category. Yes, Trevino technically has a better framing percentage. And supposedly, I I forget what the stat is called, but it is he has hit more clutch hits this year than Kirk. And clutch clutch is such a funny stat to me in a sport that is based on large sample sizes. So, like, we're what? a third the way into the season like we're talking about how clutch a guy is in june like let's (laughs) let's reel it in a little bit here yankees fans 
I just don't understand that. And I, I know you've got the stats up here. So let's just talk some of the some of the more common stats for Kirk and Trevino as to why they would be voted into the All-Star game. All right. So let's just start with batting average. Uh, Trevino, 282. Alejandro Kirk, 307. Uh, a lot of people think on-base percentage is a bigger deal. Jose Trevino, 336 for an on-base percentage. Alejandro Kirk, 395. Uh, slugging percentage, Kirk's also got him there with a 487 slugging versus a 470 slugging for Trevino. Home runs, 6 for Trevino, 8 for Alejandro Kirk. Um, we're looking at RBIs. Yeah. So this is like direct runs created, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Trevino, 21. Alejandro Kirk, 26. So, listen, there are stats out there that Trevino is beating Kirk in. And I think a uh, friend of the show, Blake Murphy from Sportsnet 590, said it best where he, and he's a big stat head, right? And he was like, if you give me enough time, I can find a reason why any player is good. Yep. And I can make that work. So really, you can truly manipulate the stats to show it how you would like. That's the beautiful thing with baseball is that they have kept track of every single little thing. Analytics is about as deep as you can possibly get. And, and you can put whatever spin on it you want. Look, every time the stat argument comes up, I mean, the Blake Murphy quote's a good one. For me, it's always uh, Bill Burr has a great line, basically, you know, Here's your side of the argument. You go to imright.com and then you find a bunch of stats to back up whatever yeah. side you want. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, imright.com. Exactly. Um, no, I mean, like you said, Trevino's having a great, like a, a really good, if not great year. Kirk's having yeah. an exceptional year. I mean, as much as I hate to say it, Trevino is to Kirk what the Blue Jays are to the Yankees. Like, yes. we're, we're, what are we, 10 games above 500? Yes, we're nine games, about 39 and 30 right now. And we feel like the the ship is on fire, don't we? Because we're not keeping up with the Yankees who are just on a yeah. historic pace. And Alejandro Kirk isn't quite having a historic season, but whatever the next He's step having... down from that is. Yeah, you know, it's a step down. It's That's the kind the of thing. history like... you don't write down, but you tell your friends about. Right. Exactly. That's a great way of putting it, man. That's a great way of putting it. And honestly, what really gets under my skin is the whole, a whole country is voting for them. A whole country. This is shit being said by people who couldn't point to Toronto on a map, have zero <laughs> idea the population of Canada, don't even understand how little the all-star game even means. I mean, especially since they removed the whoever wins the all-star game that league is the home field advantage for the World Series. So really, this game means nothing. Do you know, like, honestly, and I know you're in the same boat, Adam, we would both take the Yankees record and let them have the whole All-Star game if they wanted. You know, like, if we could just switch <laughs> spots, yeah. hell yeah. Yeah. I mean, the population of Canada is 38 million. Okay? New York yep. State's 20 million. California state is 39 million. So we're literally less than California. But Yankees fans are for sure more than 38 million. They're a crowd. I was They're just a, at a very national, right? They're the Dallas yeah. Cowboys of the MLB. They are They're iconic. Everywhere. Yeah. Everybody every city has a large population of Yankees fans and to compare it in Canadian um, standards, right? Ugh, I know it's where like you're going Leafs. with this, and I already hated it. Ugh. Yeah, it's, it's like the Leafs. the Leafs, right? It's like every fan base, you go to a Flames game, and there's against the Leafs, there's going to be 20% Maple Leafs fans, whether you like it or not. You know and how, that is the case. Go ahead, this is, sorry. This is how exactly right you are, is if you go to a, like a Flames ga game against the uh, Phoenix Coyotes, there's still going to be some Leafs jerseys in that crowd. Yes. Right? If you go to a exactly. Jays game against the Guardians, there's still going to be someone with a Yankees hat on. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And you know what? This is the thing. I was just in Toronto for the Yankees series. And, man, there was 10%, 20%, maybe even a quarter of the fan base there was Yankees fans. And they weren't from New York. 
It's not like New Yorkers are traveling everywhere to support the Yankees. They're not Jays fans, the greatest fans on the on the MLB <laughs> planet. <laughs> because um, Toronto fans travel. Toronto fans do travel. Uh, we are coast to coast, right? So that is the one uh, real advantage that Toronto has is uh, any of those northern cities are uh, – yeah, likely to be flooded with Blue Jays fans. You know, I know we saw it in Detroit. Thunder Obviously, Bay and Winnipeg come out gonna, to Minnesota games. Detroit, yeah. exactly. We're Seattle. See it in Seattle. Yeah, man. For sure. Um, I uh, got to say, though, like, man, am I ever impressed with these Blue Jays fans? I mean, I want to say stuffing the ballot box, but it's yeah. all legitimate. Well, they are. <laughs> they're doing it by the rules. But I mean, there was yeah. this groundswell of like, let's get Kirk to the All Star game. And then. So everybody has kind of gone on and voted for Kirk, which deservingly so. I mean, this isn't like a American Idol where people vote for bad singers just to be hilarious and wreck the, the whole show, right? Kirk is very mm -hmm. deserving of the all-star appearance. But it is, I think, funny for me to see, um, like, Bo Bichette uh, leading shortstop votes. Love mm -hmm. Bo Bichette, but I don't know if he should be the starting shortstop at the all-star game. Um, the fact that Matt Espinal Chapman in a second. is third. Yeah. 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 Espinal second, like Danny Jansen as fourth DH. I mean, it's great. It's like everybody went to go vote for Kirk and they were like, well, I'm not going to vote for Giancarlo Stanton over George Springer as the third outfielder. Yeah. So. No, it's true. And you know what, man, this is why they do fan voting. Yeah. So if, 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 Other baseball fans truly believe that there are more Blue Jays fans in the world than all the other teams. They're just full of shit. It's just the other fan bases aren't voting as much. That's truly the way it is, man. And we saw it happen when Kansas City, the Royals, were the best team in baseball in 2015. Of course, that's the year they won the World Series. They eliminated Jays fans. Remember that, right? We were eliminated in the ALCS by them. They had, what, nine All-Stars that year? When a fan base is engaged, they get out there and they vote. And I'm sorry to all Yankees fans who want to have a little fucking cry fest here because you're the best team in baseball but don't have enough of your players in the All-Star game. Well, how about you take the 50 million Yankees fans around the U.S. and go vote? Like, if that is actually a big deal to you. Anyways, we're, 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 we've spent, like... 15 minutes on an all-star game that really doesn't matter but i just wanted to really like absolutely drive no, home great. how that's ridiculous good. yankees fans are being how sad is it too though that when the yankees are on a historic win pace they can't get their fans engaged enough to go fucking vote <laughs> <laughs> funny thing is most of the people who are taking to twitter to complain probably still haven't voted themselves yet either still haven't, that's exactly it they're writing these huge rigging <laughs> Can't take two minutes Friends to go vote, about, but they'll spend yeah. forty-five minutes on Twitter complaining, showing looking stats, up stats on. Was, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, let's move on from there. Yeah, let's move on to the White Sox series. Obviously, this was a really tough one to swallow because the truth is the Jays could have swept this series. They lost the first game eight-seven. They were down eight-three and came all the way back. Couldn't quite pull it off. Tuesday's game was the heartbreaker because that one was lost in extra innings after giving up runs late. The game went into, what was it, Adam? Was it the 13th or the 12th I, inning? I think it was the 12th, but on, in each inning, it was like the Jays had score one, the twin, the White Sox had tied yeah. up. The next and they would just get the so thing. close. Yeah. And I mean, really, the big story of that game, which baseball fans, and it doesn't matter, the fan base really hates to hear whenever the umpire tends to be the star of the show, because Doug Edding, my goodness, and I know that this has been talked about to death over the last three days, so I'm not going to especially harp on with it an too, off too day much yesterday. here, yeah. especially with an off day yesterday. However, he did set a major league record for the, wor uh, for the year, I should say, for the most missed calls. He had 29 missed calls, according to his umpiring card. It's a lot. It's a lot. And I, I, I bring this up, not to harp on it, but, but because I wish to talk about what the Blue Jays coaching staff did for Wednesday's game, which is a very interesting tactic, something we don't see very often. And basically, Guillermo Martinez, the Blue Jays hitting coach, went out there 
to give the lineup cards to the umpires and right away got into it with them. And I don't know what he said. I don't know how he presented it, but he was tossed almost instantly. And what's beautiful is that it was just really lucky that Dan Schulman kind of caught it while it was on camera because it would have just been passed over. But Dan Schulman was like, hey, I think something's going on here. <laughs> And then, you know, they start to review the video and they're like, Guillermo Martinez just got tossed. And what I love about this, Adam, is it was obviously planned, right? Like you feel that way, that this was something that the Blue Jays coaching staff got together, set out a plan as to how they can voice their their concern about the umpiring and not have it affect their coaching staff. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, that's why Guillermo went out and not charged. Yes. Like, exactly. We need a sacrificial lamb. We're going to draw straws between Jimmy Van Ostrand, Guillermo, you know, like all of our lower level coaching staff and uh, whoever draws the short straw, you're going to go out there. You're going to shake hands. You're going to be polite. And then you're going to say, well, I hope the strike zone's more accurate today. And that's probably all it I... was for a comment. Like, I don't think he went out and said, hey you know, pointed and poked anybody in the chest and was like, you fucking sucked yesterday. I think it was mm -hmm. just like a sarcastic, like, oh, good. We have a different home plate umpire today. And then they were like, all he right, got... get out of here. You know, like, yeah, he got heated when he got tossed. Yeah. And exactly. I got, he got in, he got in their face a little bit. You there. get your I money's worth what... once you're tossed, right? Absolutely. And I wonder, it's so funny because my guess is that he had the umpiring scorecard on the lineup. <laughs> card because like so? man you you watch the video and the umpire looks down and then they're mad right they look down then he's upset and what i loved about that toss is how subtle it was which just goes to show you the ump show is a real thing man because that umpire if he knew that he was on camera would have made a big production swing in his arm you're out of here <laughs> but Instead, it was just like his finger. It was just like, all right, you're gone. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, But it then, is. then, and listen, different umpire, and I forget the name of the umpire, which is really unfortunate. I should have done my research a little bit better. No, Show my no, no. work. No, no, Scott. This is exactly what's wrong with umpires. They should be nameless, faceless creatures. Almost like a robot. Good, yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the point. Never mind the, oh, I forgot the name of this umpire. We're not watching baseball to no. know, oh, okay, it's Angel Hernandez or Fiasco Martinez or whatever yes. idiot LeBron, right? Like, yeah. just get out there and call your game. We don't need to know anybody's backstory. Like, there's a reason we're interviewing prospects and players with the Jays, and we're not interviewing any umpires to hear about <laughs> their career path to the majors, right? Like, yes. Get out of here with this. So, sorry, continue. And no, we don't no. need to know whose name it was. It's actually a great point, buddy. But the umpire on Wednesday had, I think, three missed calls. And it was a beautifully umpired game. And the Jays were fired up, man. I honestly believe that psychologically, the coaching staff having this team's back like they did is part of why they rebounded so heavily in Wednesday's game. Right? Like they were in that game to win it, man. And it was from inning one, one. The bats were alive. Ross Stripling pitched a freaking gem. The man has an ERA under three as a starter. It's just unbelievable what he is pulling off right now. And the fact he went six innings and isn't allowed to go three times through the order is incredible. Like we talk about Ross Stripling, it feels like every single episode. But it's because he continues to perform at a, a above his career average levels, right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, okay. enough. What else can yeah, you say about I mean, him? He's been what else can you say more about than him? we could have asked for? Speaking of of guys who have just been a, a beacon of light over the last little bit, Matt Chapman. Did you see Wednesday's game by chance or catch Jays in 30? Yeah, I caught the Jays in 30. It felt like Matt Chapman single-handedly saved, what, three, four runs? 
yeah. Um, like, he was a wall at third. Nothing got by him. He was making plays that I would say the majority of third basemen wouldn't have even gotten to the ball, let alone turn double plays, right? Like, yeah. yeah, so impressive. So impressive. And even the fact, and I know that this was just watching the the pregame, or I should say uh, the postgame after that, after that Wednesday win, Ross Stripling even came out and he said that Chappie went up to him before the game and said, listen, man, let me eat. And then it pretty much just was pretty much just like, man, just make sure the ball's on the ground and I got your back. And then he proceeded to prove that he did. And I think that's one of the reasons why Stripling was able to go six innings is that he wasn't needing to pick the corners and worry about strikeouts. He was just like, let's get the ball in play and Chappie's got this. And then he did. And there's something to be said for that confidence wise when a pitcher goes on the mound and they just know that that, that infield's got their back, right? Like that's a yeah. big deal. Yeah. Yeah. It is a, a massive deal. Um, uh, I, I love Matt Chapman. I'm sad that this is only going to be a two year mm-hmm. relationship. Like, I don't know. Even offensively. Yeah. Even offensively, he's really picked it up since April. I know that uh, there was some concern, even though his peripheral stats really still looked good, you know, like exit velo off the bat, the barrel rate, all of that stuff that kind of shows whether a guy's being lucky or unlucky or just the numbers are the numbers. And, you know, the stats showed that Matt was being unlucky in a lot of cases throughout April and part of May. But now that we're seeing him put the bat on the ball a little bit more, I know you've got the stats up. So let's just check where Matt's at. Uh, offensively right now. All right. Well, Matt Chapman has a batting average on the season of 214 uh, on base percentage of 300. So still not the best, nope. um, but it's trending in the right direction. And uh, he's at nine home runs, 27 RBI on the year. So when we first acquired Matt Chapman, I know what we kind of expected out of him was – a batting average of three of uh, 220, 230, on base percentage of 320, 25 to 30 home runs, 80, 90 RBIs. This is what he's on pace for right now. So, yeah. so let me just point this out too. Since uh, the low point in the season of him, May 15th, so about halfway through what we're at right now let's say we're at the end of june right Mm -hmm. um so about the midway point that we've played so far his batting average was sitting at 182 uh, well below the mendoza line which uh, is basically the line that says it doesn't matter how good you are defensively if your batting average is below 200 yeah a platinum glove isn't enough to make up for a batting average below that that's you know the historic idea behind the Mendoza. Line. Yes. But since then, so since May 15th, um, he's now hitting 252 with an on-base percentage of 348 and a slugging of 427. So an OPS of 775. Um, wow. I mean, wow. Nobody says wow to 252 for a batting average, except that like this year numbers are down and whatever. Yeah. Like, and a 252 from a platinum glover you'll take yeah. that any day right a hundred percent and you know what like like you said numbers are down so yes that ops of 775 isn't wow was the wrong reaction but i just meant wow and how much he has improved totally since the beginning of the season and and he really has started to uh, we talked about how clutch isn't a thing but now i'm about to say that he has been clutch but like defensive clutch is different. You yeah. can be defensively clutch and Matt Chapman is exactly that. So let's move on to another Matt that has been very impressive for this team. Friend of the show, Matt Gage. We were lucky enough to have him on about six weeks ago, just before he got the call up to the bigs from Buffalo. Uh, 29 year old journeyman that had booted around the minor leagues for almost 10 years. He wound up being washed up in Mexico in 2019. He reinvented his arm slot. Like, this is the type of story baseball fans just love to hear about. And then he gets the call up to the Jays. And, dude, 
Like the guy has been nails. Can you quickly run down his stats? Because I know when they ran him out there in extra innings on Tuesday's game, there was we were I was in the Discord just chatting away with mm-hmm. a lot of our our um, our followers and our community. Yeah, and there was a little bit of concern, and it was funny because then his numbers were flashed up, and everyone was like, "Holy shit!" I didn't know Matt Gage was doing this well. And yes, they have integrated him slowly into low leverage situations and allowed him to get his feet wet as a big league player. But he continues to get outs when they need it. He continues to get the job done and has started to move up that pecking order, especially when we watched Ryan Barucki get DFA'd. We've watched Andrew Vesquez struggle at times so there is an opening for another lefty in this pen and matt gage is taking advantage so adam how how good has matt been so he's got six appearances this year uh seven and two-thirds innings so he's mm-hmm. he's had a couple you know multi-inning or inning and a half type performances uh era sitting at 1.17 so very nice there yeah, whip small sample size, but he's getting the job done. Whip is probably the more important stat for a reliever, uh, and his whip is o six five two. He doesn't walk guys, and he doesn't give up hits. Like, what more can you ask for a lefty out of the pen? Yeah, and this this extra innings appearance was his first truly high leverage situation, and I don't think that the Blue Jays particularly wanted. To put him in this situation, no, but, but we'd already used Romano, we'd already yeah. used Tim Meza. It's like, okay, well, he's the Timber next guy available. Used. Yeah, yeah. So. absolutely. And he stepped up, man, and he did a fantastic job. You know, he, especially in that extra, the extra, you know, Manfred's man is still uh, a rule in baseball currently. So, you know, he's going out there with a guy starting on second. So he's pitching out of the stretch. And Manfred's yeah, man, he, he, man, is that what we're calling the, what? The ghost like runner, the ghost runner, because I hate ghost yeah. runner. You know that man. Yeah, I man. do. Oh, I like Manfred's that. Manfred's man. I forget who in uh, Discord mentioned that. I, I don't know if that is uh, just a term everyone's using, but well, let's, let's uh, use I got that it. more often. Manfred's man. Yeah, it's great because yeah. it's also like a dig at Manfred directly. A hundred percent for a stupid 100%. idea. Oh yeah, this is great. Manfred's man. Okay, coin it. Let's put <laughs> put that on a T-shirt. Get your designs in now. <laughs> actually while we're talking that while we're talking that we do have a a bit of a contest going on i wouldn't really say it's a contest but more we just wish to put our community's art on display and i know that we use the term bad taco pretty regularly and we're looking for designs for a t-shirt so if you do have an idea of a badass taco feel free to uh, uh, you can p- upload that into our Discord. You can send it on email. We've got some email ones. Uh, you can send it on Twitter, Instagram, DM us, however you'd like to get it to us. I know we got one from, uh, it was emailed from Cooper. D. Cooper emailed one, and it was so funny. It was just a taco, and then in the taco was a head of Tyler Chatwood. <laughs> oh, God. Tanner Rourke and uh, Rafael Dolis. And it just had the baddest taco. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> yeah, it's so funny, fun. man. There's some great yeah, ideas I coming have, in. So yeah, some really good ideas. Yeah. So, anyways, you can go ahead and do that. We'll move on with the show here. I know. Um, we should get this finished up here. So let's talk Milwaukee. The boys in blue are in Wisconsin to start a series against the NL Central leading Milwaukee Brewers tonight. And it is Manoa Day, baby. So Alec Manoa going against Adrian Hauser for the Milwaukee Brewers. Hauser has been um, about everything you would expect out of their number five starter. He's got an ERA around 4.5. He's definitely not. This is probably our best chance to win a game. In Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Now the Brewers are 40 and 32. The Jays are 39 and 30. We're very comparable records wise, very comparable team wise. Both teams have high end starters at the top of the rotation. And then it kind of thins out as you get down. 
So Manoa going is a really good sign for the Jays today. He continues to dominate start after start after start. So excited about that. Tomorrow's game is where we could be up against it. You say Kikuchi goes to the mound against last year's NL Cy Young winner, Corbin Burns, who continues to dominate. He's had a couple of rough starts recently, but all in all, he's still going to be getting Cy Young votes in 2022. So that is probably going to be the big challenge in this series. And then Sunday, Jose Barrios takes the bump against, you guessed it, TBA. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, TBA is right. The dreaded to-be-announced pitcher. Well, Milwaukee's starting pitching might be one of the best in the league, but they do have several injuries. We don't need to deal with Freddie Peralta. We don't need to deal deal with Brandon Woodruff. Now, Josh Hader is back in the lineup. I know he was injured for a little bit. Josh Hader, just a unicorn of a reliever, just a beast. He's a guy you don't see very often, a dominant reliever with incredible stuff that can regularly pitch two innings. He might be the best reliever in baseball. I would say he is. I don't even know who you would argue is better than Josh Hader. But uh, the Jays are in for a heck of a series. So if you've got to look at this Brewers lineup and you need to take a guess, Adam, at how this team fares in this matchup, how are you feeling with the boys going to Milwaukee? I don't know. I think we can. I think we can do all right. I think we can do, go two yeah. or three. I agree. Uh, you know what? The the Blue Jays also do quite well against National League teams. So, especially now that it's universal DH and they don't need to worry about their pitchers trying to put lumber on the ball. So, I feel good about this series. I think that Wednesday's game was a big win. The Blue Jays' bullpen is in trouble. This isn't news. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it because it just gets talked about to death. So if there is going to be a problem, it's probably going to be with the bullpen. However, the nice thing is Alec Manoa should be able to go deep into this game. We had an off day yesterday. Uh, Ross Stripling had a heck of a game on Wednesday, so they didn't need to go deep into the bullpen. So all in all, the top guys for this pen is Restred. Uh, rested. Tim Meza is starting to look better. Of course, he came off of injury probably sooner than he should have. I'm not saying he was still injured. I am saying, however, that I think if the Jays weren't so desperate for a high leverage lefty reliever, they would have let him take two or three rehab starts. You know, rehab, get him in there in AAA and kind of let him find his stuff again, whereas he was really thrust back into this Blue Jays bullpen. And we've seen the downfall of that, right? He hasn't been as sharp as he was before injury, but he's starting to look like himself again. So that's good news for the Blue Jays. You know darn well Ross Atkins is on the phone every single day, beating bushes, trying to figure out what he can do right now. But it is looking more and more like this is a waiting game. They're going to need to make sure that the teams that they're dealing with are prepared to give stuff up at the price that they should be paying, right? So they might they might prefer to just wait and hold on for two more weeks and get a guy at the price they should get him for than overpay for him to get him now. But we'll see what happens. Um, speaking of that, I did want to talk expanded playoffs here real quickly, which is one of the reasons why we're going to need to wait till much closer to the trade deadline to see things happen is that there are more teams involved in the wild card race. Sure. That said, I'm a little disappointed in the way that this whole thing has played out. It was really touted when the CBA was amended that the reason they're expanding playoffs is to encourage more competition amongst these middling teams that some may feel inclined to rebuild rather than continue to try and win. But it hasn't really played out that way. Seven of 15 teams in the AL East are over 500. So not even half the teams are over 500 in the American League. 
8 of 15 in the NL. So 15 out of 30 teams, half the teams, are even above 500. Isn't that kind of just the math of it, though? Like, sorry I to guess. push back on you, but no. I mean, isn't that just like the definition of 500 in a way? And I, I know there are ways that it can be different than that, but how many times in a season are 20 teams above 500 in any I given think, year? Like 500 think, just means half, right? Yeah, but I think what uh, MLB was hoping would happen is that the disparity would be a little bit uh a little bit smaller, you know, like the, the the 10 bottom teams would get beat up on and those 10 middle teams would have a better record and be able to continue to try and compete. I It hasn't really played out that way. I mean, you do make a good point. Look, Obviously, I'm going to take the opposite side on this for sure. Like, I think if anything, this shows that like maybe the bottom teams aren't as bad as like, maybe that's where the parody is taking place is instead of at the top of it, it's taking place at the bottom of it. I mean, you don't want parody among the Pirates at Cincinnati Reds and no, uh, start bragging true. about, look at the parody we've gotten in, in Oakland here. Um, but I, I I think that wins and losses record, I'm, I don't know, man. I think we're going to see that parody come the trade deadline, right? I think that's where the expanded playoffs is going to have its effect because – Right now, if I'm looking at this AL, I got to go pretty far down the list to find a team who's not going to be a buyer at the deadline. I got to go 10 teams deep. Well, right now, through... it's the, look, look, here's our list of, of playoff competitive teams where I would say if you're a fan in this market, you expect your team to spend and make a push. You got the Yankees, Houston, Toronto, Boston, Cleveland, Minnesota, Tampa, Chicago, obviously. Um, but then you got the Rangers, two games below 500. They're only four and a half out of that last wild card spot. The LA Angels, I mean, they had that horrific slide, but that's a team that mm-hmm. should be competing and making a push. Beyond that, you've mm-hmm. only got Baltimore, Seattle, Detroit, Kansas, and Oakland. The NL isn't any different. Like, well, I I guess my problem was I was really hoping that the three wild card spots there would be three or four teams below them truly competing, and it doesn't feel that way. Um, I'm not I, discounting what you're saying. I just, I don't know what, like, because we're talking about the Jays making a desperation move early, right? Like, in theory, that's that's the point of the season we're at, June 24th, where to make a trade right now, to jump out in front of the market or whatever, and potentially overpaying to get a bullpen arm or to get a starting, like, a starting pitcher or that lefty bat or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. That's it for everybody. Like, nobody is out there making move so i don't really know what we would expect to see out of the la angels right now like they kind of just have to bide time figure out and like survive for another month and then it's okay now let's go in like now we're you know two games out of a wild spot spot let's uh let's make that push so i think that'll be the more telling time frame to look at and and you're right you're right. The larger sample side is important here before we truly judge whether this worked or not. I am curious what you think, though. It, right now, it looks like there's six teams. So I think it's the uh, the Athletics, the Reds, the Nationals, the Royals, the Cubs, and the Tigers are all on pace to lose more than a hundred games. Is that too many teams losing a hundred games, dude? In your in your opinion. The- this is where, again, I got to push back on you. You just started this conversation with you were hoping that the bottom teams would get beat up on. That's the bottom teams getting beat up on. I guess. I don't know. No. I, I, I would say, yeah, set the bottom six on fire. Let's have 24 good teams fighting it out for 16 playoff spots. That's my no, dream world. That's- yeah, no, I, I was too. I guess it's just the the middle section of the league isn't as good as I was hoping it would be. But, but look at maybe any you're league, right. man. Look at the NHL. Look at, like, any league. Like, the middle 15 teams are going to be the middle 15 teams. Like, we're not going to have an – like, there's no playoff format that creates, like, 15 teams that are – the New York Yankees yeah. and the LA Dodgers. Uh, like that's well, never well, going to happen. It can't be done. Absolutely. I, and that is not what I was trying to get at here, but yes, I do. 
I do agree with you. I don't on know. That like, I'm, I'm looking at the whites, the Chicago White Sox, right? Like they just took two out of three against us. They are definition of a middle of the pack team in the AL East. They're 33 and 35. This is a team that has been cannibalized by bad tacos and injuries all year mm-hmm. long. What else do you want? Like if you're honestly a Chicago White Sox fan, what else can you do other than like cross your fingers, hope that they like get healthy and then make like one or two moves at the deadline? Like there there's this is the team you have at this point. It's not from lack of mm-hmm. spending, it's not from lack of like yeah. development or anything, right? Like they've got the guys, they've got the pieces in place. Maybe you fire the manager. But other yeah. than that, like this is a, a tough luck team who's still right in the thick of it. They're four and a half you know games what? out of a wild card spot. I, I mean, that's the quintessential that's the team best, who that's the best three years ago made. maybe is selling it, right? Like maybe three years ago, or you know, you go back to where there was, you know, four playoff teams or the coin toss one game playoff wild card. Maybe the White Sox in that situation are going. We're way too far back. If we don't catch the Twins. Mm-hmm or the Guardians, or whoever, there's no, like, we have no shot at hell, so we might as well sell off and, and try and rebuild, you know? That That is a point that I will give you. That's the best point you've made, where I just, uh, yeah. I win. I mean, the White Sox <laughs> spending. The Angels yeah. are spending. No, you're right. You're right. Like, there are teams in that middle pack that are trying to win, and they're just bad management. And, I mean, that happens in every league. I don't know. I don't know why it bothers me. I guess it's just I was I'm an old man who didn't even want the playoffs expanded and I it know, just feels man. like it's not working, but I it, it you're right. It is what it is. Like and it truly can't be judged until the end of the season. So, I guess uh, uh here's here's what I'm honestly for me this is where it all kind of starts and ends is like this trade deadline. Yes. But again, this is going to be a one-year sample. So we're going to have to see five trade deadlines to see how it really shakes out, but I'm expecting fireworks this trade deadline. I think there mm-hmm. are going to be a lot of moves. I mean, I was just watching Blair and Barker before the show when we were talking about the the Jays, right? Jays need mm-hmm. two bullpen arms. They need yes. a left-handed hitter, and they need a starting pitcher, right? The Jays yes. are not going to be able to go out, get the best starting pitcher on the market, get the top two bullpen arms on the market, and get the top left-handed hitter available. Like, they're no. not, because there's going to no. be teams who... The Boston Red Sox, the Tampa Bay Rays, yeah. you know, the New York Yankees still have room to raise their hand and go, well, we can't just let the Blue Jays take everybody, right? So, like, mm-hmm. you know, Jeff Blair kept saying they're not operating in a vacuum. They can't just go yeah. out, pay whatever a price for these four guys and go, okay, well, we got – we fixed all of our holes. Let's let's move on now, right? Because that's, again, where this expanded playoffs is going to take place. Like, who saw the Minnesota Twins being a – contender for Carlos Correa you know what I no, mean it's like, a great point so that's where we're going to see teams raise their like the Texas Rangers went out and got Marcus Simeon and Seager like the Texas Rangers aren't going to just push their chips in and go well we'll try again next year right good point so yeah. I think be prepared to see the Texas Rangers go out and solve some of their holes and make a big splash of the trade deadline they're right in it still you know Yeah, it's going to be an exciting trade deadline for sure. Like there are going to be far more teams competing and maybe that maybe that has maybe that's going to be the big positive out of this expanded playoff. Yeah, I think that'll be the measuring stick for how this records. Yeah, than the records of the teams. Absolutely. So there's only so many wins to go around, right? Like it's at the end of the season. If you take everybody's record, the average is 500. By like by definition, half the half the games are a win, half the games are a loss. Yeah. But yeah, I, I do think that uh, we'll we'll see some big splashes at the trade deadline, and I think that'll be the best way to measure who's who's being, how many teams are really being competitive and going for it. Because again, I do think you don't have to look too far back to uh, to look at trade deadlines of yesteryear, and. Like the New York Yankees running away with it in in previous years, it would feel like, well, why even bother? Mm-hmm. You know, why even bother putting your chips in just to lose in the first round to the New York Yankees, anyways? But then you watch an '88 team win in Atlanta, win the World Series last year, and you're like, you know what? Just get there. 
just get there. Yeah. And then, I mean, we started the show with 2001. The Seattle Mariners, 116 wins, all-time win record. Mm -hmm. Didn't make the World Series. Yeah. So, I don't know. The game's still got to be played. Still got to be played. It's an interesting spot for the Blue Jays to be in because they really do have to decide, is this the year we want to go all in? Is this the year that we want to sell the farm, go and get those pieces? Or do you... Do you re-roll it for next year, right? Do you go, well, let's try and get some more playoff experience, right? Let's be happy making the playoffs. Let's see if we can do some damage with what we got. And then next year we'll push push our chips all in. And I, I don't, How do you feel about that strategy? I don't like it. I don't I, like I, it I, either because there's always I, I, a reason to wait till next year, right? Yes, of course. The Yankees there is. aren't going to go away. The Red Sox are only going to get better as their, you know, prospects start to get called up. The Rays are going to be the Rays forever. Like there's just always a reason to go, well, let's let's not go all in quite yet. And then here's the other thing. If the chips were on the other table or foot i'm mixing my analogies here if the blue jays were on pace for 120 wins if you're this kicking year, the cat down the road yes you're I kicking get it the out. cat down the road uh <laughs> even then like if you're just the far and away front runner you can't just stand pat at the deadline and go i don't know it's it's tough it's just a. it's gonna be interesting to see how it all plays out it's going to be a wild trade deadline. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, let's end the show on this. Sure. We are getting close to the hour mark, so we'll wrap things up. I just did wish to talk. Um, well, I wanted to talk Shohei Otani really quickly here because his dominance continues to shine bright. I mean, we watched him this week do some things that has never been done before. He's the first player in history of baseball to have an 8-RBI game and a 13K game in his career and he did it in back-to-back -back appearances. <laughs> On Tuesday, he put up eight RBIs and then goes, hits the mound and pitches eight innings, five, uh, eight, sorry, eight innings in a 5 nothing win and has 13 Ks. And yes, it was the Kansas City Royals. However, 13 Ks is pretty darn impressive, especially after completely dominating offensively in the game before. And I wanted to ask your opinion on this, Adam, because there is, and I know you're not on Twitter, and I know that Arden Zwelling even made fun of me for judging too much on how people are feeling on sure. what's going on on Twitter, right? So right. we will take this with a grain of salt. However, there is a large contingency of the old school Angels fans who... Whenever it gets brought up how good Shohei Otani is, really pushes back. And I don't understand why there is a divide in this fan base as to how awesome Shohei Otani is. And these, this, this, this divide, this, and I, I, when I say divide, I don't mean it's 50 50, obviously. It, it's a more of a sliver of the fan base, a very vocal sliver of the fan base who refuses to kind of give him the credit that is deserved. Why do you think that is? Um, I think it's the same thing we see with guys like Bo Bichette or Vlad Guerrero or any of them. Like we see it in Toronto. I think it's, mm -hmm. you know, when someone is that great, it's just easier to nitpick and to be critical. Like, I don't know. The Nickelback it's, effect. The Nickelback effect. <laughs> since, as soon as you get too big, everyone's like, get down. Get off of there. <laughs> well, no, but I, I do think that they're, let's call it the Top Gun effect, right? Okay. Top Gun, almost universally beloved by critics and fans alike, right? So what can you, like if you're a movie critic, what can you write about the new Top Gun movie to stand out. Oh, it was amazing. Oh, the special effects were awesome. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Everything about it was great. Everybody's saying that. So the easiest way to stand out, shit on it. Don't say it. Yeah. Right? Go, no, it was overrated. Here's all the flaws and try and pick apart issues that weren't really issues that like nobody cared about. Right? Like, oh, well, the lighting in the third scene was kind of dark. Right? Like, whatever. 
that's that's what's happening with Shohei Otani, right? Like he's just he's the top gun of baseball players right now, and it's just easy to go. Well, he's not leading the MLB in home runs. He doesn't have as many home runs as Aaron Judge, right? It's just way. It's the yeah. same thing with Boba Shett, right? Super yeah. like he's gonna lead the league in hits for ten out of the next twenty years. Yeah. Right. But yeah, but look how many errors he has. Yeah. Look how stupid his hair looks. Like just stupid stuff. <laughs> no, right? like, you're right, man. Absolutely. But it's easier to write an article that, you know, gets clicks or to have a tweet that mm-hmm. gets shared when you're highlighting, you know, you went to I'm right dot com and you found a reason that Shohei Otani's quote unquote struggling this year. Yeah. I don't know. The haters. It's a good point, buddy. That's actually exactly probably what it is. So yeah. uh, it's the haters. It's the Josh and Bill haters of the world. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's wrap it there. Okay. Let's wrap it there. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for following along with these two boneheads both adam and i really appreciate all the support we really enjoy this little walk-off community that has kind of been built on the back of of you folks so we really appreciate you feel free to join the discord that is always free there's a link in the show notes uh chatting and blue jays fandom is alive and well 24 7 in that app So you can check that out. You can join us on Twitter at Walk Off Podcast. We're now over a thousand followers. Woo woo! Thank you, everybody. Uh, You can follow us on Instagram, the Walk Off Podcast. And of course, if you are this deep into the episode and have yet to hit the like button or are not subscribed, we truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you to everybody who follows us every single week. All the best.